All right, we want to welcome you to New Covenant Grace Fellowship in Inverness, Florida this morning. Uh, many people, you know, did you see the paper this morning? Did you see the boats that are out there scalloping? My lands, I tell you what, I sure wouldn't want to be waiting at the boat ramp trying to get out there. But um, again, we're, everybody from around the country are coming to Citrus County, to the beautiful nature coast, and they're doing one thing, swimming in the, in the, in the water there, picking up those little scallops, and they get, they get to keep, what, a pint? <laughs> is that the legal limit, Matt? A pint, I think, isn't it? Two, uh, gallons. two gallons of whole scallops. Ten gallons per boat. Yeah, ten gallons per boat, but, but per person, I think it comes to a pint of scallops. That is about one mouthful for me with scallops, because I love them, you know? But uh, anyway, welcome, and we welcome you that are watching on, on the Internet and watching on YouTube today our YouTube channel, and you may just have stumbled on us. Well, we want to bless you in the name of Jesus. I have a very, I believe, a very important message that I want to share with you today. In all honesty, it's one that I don't want to share with you today. Um, It's based upon um, the things that are currently going on in our nation. I couldn't help but thinking one of the songs that Chris uh, talked about is Love, 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 and that That's what God is, and my lands, if there was ever a day when we need to be sharing the love of God, it's today, because there's a lot of anything but love, and unfortunately, there's a lot of things but love being found in the church today, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't think that that's very healthy. We're going to touch on some of that, but the title of my message this morning, and this will probably get your attention, the title of my message this morning is the Supreme Court in our church. The Supreme Court in our church. This week, the United States Supreme Court was dominating the news headlines of our nation. Just over the last couple of days, of course, social media was totally lit up with all types of hype in regarding the court's decision on gay marriage. For the most part, I want to say this, I am pretty ashamed um, at many, maybe even most of the remarks that I read from Christian people in social media over the last couple of days. One gal, a noted prophet who travels and ministers around the country, I'm not going to mention her name, but she said this. This is an exact quote from her Facebook wall. She says, quote, I'm just saying, get ready, stock up, Seven years of judgment is about to hit. It's going to be rough. And then she referenced Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2, which has, by the way, nothing to do with America, but refers to the future glory of Jerusalem during the Old Covenant. But yet she used this to substantiate her her prophecy of doom. Let me say this about judgment, and this is the main reason why I I want to go into this today. Let me say this about judgment. Jesus came to not judge the world, but to save it. Jesus came to not judge the world, but to save it. If you'd please turn with me to John chapter 3, verse 16. Our first passage that we want to look at today is John chapter 3, verse 16. And you notice it's up on the wall now with our our new equipment. Praise God for it, huh? We can follow along. But we're going to look at 16 and 17, Dave. But anyway, we all know 16. We can quote it. For God loved the what? Huh? The world, right? Does that world include everybody? If God loved the world, is there anybody in the world that God doesn't love? No No matter what they do, no matter where they've come from, no matter, you know, what they've been involved in, what their past has been like, is there anybody in this world that God doesn't love? God so loved the world, so much that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Then verse 17. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world. God sent his son, Jesus, into the world to what? 
not judge the world. So when someone, I don't care how great of a prophet they claim to be, when someone says, the Lord has told me that God is going to judge America, is that really a true word? Because why? Jesus didn't come to judge the world. He came so the judgment was already taken care of. Jesus was judged on the cross. He was found guilty so that you and I could be found innocent. The world is innocent, spiritually speaking. We know that we ain't all innocent in the things we do, right? We do mess up. We do do dumb, stupid things of the flesh that we call it around here. But regardless of the fact, our spirits, the spirit of mankind is innocent because of what Jesus Christ did. So we see this, and so when someone starts talking about all this judgment stuff, what they're not doing is they're not rightly dividing the word of God. Again, Jesus didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. So when people talk about God's wrath, my point is, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to go on today and, and talk about this today, God's wrath is not, no matter what happened this past week, no matter what decisions the Supreme Court made or didn't make, I want you to know, based upon what the Supreme Court did this week, God's wrath is not going to fall on America. And the reason why I say that is because non-spiritual men the justices of the Supreme Court, made non-spiritual rulings. Somehow we Christians have gotten it all mixed up. We, for instance, we vote for the President of the United States, and we say, well, I don't want to vote for this man to be the President of the United States because he's not, um, he's not where I am spiritually. He disagrees with my theology. Well, one of the things I might suggest to you that he is the President of the United States, not the first pastor of the United States. And there's a big difference. We have men, let me just say this, we have men in Washington, D.C., we have men in Tallahassee, uh, believe it or not, we even have men right down the road in Lakanto, believe me, that don't have the slightest idea what they're doing, spiritually speaking. Come on. They don't understand spiritual concepts. They don't understand spiritual truths. So when they get involved in things that have a spiritual ring to them, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, I'm not talking about the Democrats, as many, as many people in the churches would believe that I'm preaching against the Democrats, I'm preaching against Obama, I'm preaching against... No, I'm not. Because I'm going to give you a little tip here. The Republicans are just as bad. And so are the independents. They're all nuts. And to be honest with you, they all need to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't give me... I, I get so tired of, of, of getting, you know, the... It's just the way it is. We have unspiritual people making spiritual decisions. So when the Supreme Court decision came down Friday morning, I wasn't shocked by it. Because I tell you what I would have been shocked by if it would have gone the other way. That would have really shocked me. I kind of sort of expected that this is the way it was going to go. Because I just know this is the way things are going. This is the trend that we see happening in America. Now, I'm gonna, whether this is right, wrong, or indifferent, we're, we're going to get into this in a minute, and, and I'm going to show you some things. But I really felt, based upon some of this stuff, that I have, uh, I have the, the, the pastoral job here to, to share with you, to bring some comfort to you all. And, and this is, I don't care what you read on Facebook today, listen to me, judgment is not going to fall on America. We are in a place of blessing. When we understand the fullness of the new covenant, when we understand what God has really done for us through Jesus Christ, man, we're in the place of blessing. Now, what happens is when we start living that out in our lives, it begins to affect those that are around us. I believe that we as Americans should vote. Come on, vote. Get registered if you're not. I believe it's important to vote. Who you vote to, for is up to you. It's not my job to tell you who to vote for. It's your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you. But the main thing is, is this. Knowing that there's a bunch of goofiness there, that knowing we have a responsibility to, to, to do what we're supposed to do and hope that we're doing the very best we can, but the fact of the matter is 
that we all live in a higher kingdom. You and I, I am not, I'm a citizen of the United States of America. I'm proud of that. I'm proud to be American. I've traveled in a lot of countries around the world. I, there's not a country alive uh, that, that exists that I'd rather trade my life for here. But saying that, I'm a real citizen of a higher country. It's actually a kingdom, and it's the kingdom of God. That's where I really live. And when we understand that, see, the real answer is, yeah, we're supposed to vote, but, but if you really want to take care of everything and really see the world get straightened out, just start winning your neighbors to the Lord. Talk to, talk, talk to them about Jesus Christ. And they start, start talking to their neighbor, and they start talking to their neighbor, and guess what? We begin to see the change take place. So, we have non-spiritual people making non-spiritual decisions, and should we therefore expect anything other than what happens? Now, let me also just say this. There's a lot of stuff out there. Some of you are not, not even going to understand what I'm talking about because you don't follow this stuff, and, and I'm just saying, blessed are you if that's the case. But a lot of us do follow this stuff, and we see it. There's been a lot of talk just recently about the four blood, blood moons. Have you followed any of that? The four blood moons. And the four blood moons, they came around on the feast days, uh, the feast seasons this year. Uh, the Jewish feast days. These are the moon was very, very huge and very dark red, and they call that that actually happens. They call it a blood moon. There was four of those events this past year. They all happened on Jewish feast seasons. So therefore, there are certain people that have been writing books about that and saying because these four blood moons showed up in on Jewish feast seasons that it means that there is danger ahead for the world around us, you know. There is judgment coming. There's all these terrible things that are going to happen. Um, I might suggest to you that it's probably, uh, the real reason behind it is it sells a lot of books. And there's a lot of gullible people that read that stuff. I'm also going to say this. There's also another book called The Harbinger. Has anybody read that? Um, there's a rabbi uh, that's running around, claims to be Americans, America's prophet. And um, the harbinger, you know, what, you know what the harbinger means? The harbinger thing, what it really means, it's, it means it's talking about the ancient mysteries that hold the secret of America's future. That's all, the whole basis on what the book um, puts out. Well, I got news for you, folks. The Old Testament under the Old Covenant does not in any way, shape, or form hold the secret to America's future. Those things were for Israel's future, have nothing to do with you and I today. But yet people buy this stuff up, they put it all over Facebook, they get all caught up into this stuff, and um, you know, it, it, it's, just not, it's just not the way it is. I find it interesting, and again, I've been doing a lot of soul searching on some of this stuff, that, especially some of the stuff I'm going to share with you here in a second. I've, some of you know, some of you know my heart on it, some of the things that I've mentioned in times past, the last several months, about some of these issues, and now we find it all being forced upon us to come to the forefront. But, 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 you know, let me just say this. When America had slaves, and slavery was legal in the United States, there was no judgment of God upon America. I happen to think that slavery is a whole lot worse than anything that would deal with homosexuality. Personal opinion, but I'm just sharing that with you. When America took land from the Native Americans, the American Indians, murdering them sometimes, no judgment fell upon America. When America had the Jim Crow laws, which led to severe oppression of our black people, no judgment fell upon America. Should have. But God, for some reason, allowed that stuff to go on and did not judge. When even organizations like the KKK had influence in state and federal government, there was no judgment that fell upon America. Now, let the Supreme Court say that gay marriage is legal in all 50 states. Watch out, the sky is about to fall. Not so. Not so. I couldn't really believe some of the things that I was reading and how radical many leaders within the church are in regards to the gay marriage issue. However, I'm totally convinced that what happened Friday 
will likewise also have a lasting result on all of us Christians, and that includes those of us in our church. And, you know, that's why I decided to share what I'm about to share with you today and what I have shared with you today. And the reason is, is because we are in a transition state and uh, we're going to be walking a very, very thin line. Not just our church, but any church. Is we're going to be walking a very thin line. So I think it's very important that we understand some of this stuff. Again, as I've said before, I've personally done a lot of soul searching on these issues. And, and I'll be honest with you, these are not pleasant for me to talk about. I really even wrestled, uh, Matthew again, didn't know for sure he's going to make it today. And I even wrestled, well, maybe that's a good thing he doesn't make it today. But, I, but then I felt like this does need to be recorded because we have to set a precedent and, and about some of the things that I'm going to share with you. I believe it's very important that what we're doing today is setting a precedent, even to the degree that we're videotaping this and, and recording this for all future people, including ourselves, to look at. I think it's very important to look at specifically what the scriptures say on the subject and seeing that we are what we call a New Covenant church to especially look and see what the Apostle Paul had to say about this issue. So, remember this. Paul uh, received a, a, a direct revelation of New Covenant grace from Jesus himself. He talks about this in Galatians 1, how he spent three years being taught the, the concepts of the New Covenant and by Jesus himself. So when Paul begins to share these things, it definitely becomes the Word of God. It becomes the Word of God for our lives. So I thought, well, on these issues, you know, we could look back at some of the Old Testament stuff. We could look at, we could look at some of these other writings, and, and much of that uh, uh, definitely is in place. But I felt like, just for the sake of argument today, let's just take a look at it just from the standpoint of Paul himself and, um, and, and just base it upon that. So first of all, let's look at, at Paul's uh, take on, on the whole gay issue. Turn with me, please, to Romans chapter 1. And, and most people know this. This is the famous, when anybody talks about gay issues or homosexuality or anything, this is where these things usually start out. But chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Um, again, this is Paul. Now, I want you to know, again, who is he talking to? If you look at this in complete context you will find that Paul is speaking to the world. He's not speaking to the church. He's speaking to those who are outside of the church. They're outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ at this period of time. It's very important because as you go through chapters 1, 2, and 3 especially, you begin to see a little switch over. As you look at that, you see he's talking to the world, he's talking to the Jews, he's also talking to the church in certain places. So you have to understand that and study that out when you're going through that. But Chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, this is the New Living Translation. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now again, you see that he's talking to the world. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have made the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his ex in his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. King James talks about even nature itself tells you that God exists. You know, you, you can go out and pick a clover. You can't around here because they don't exist around here. But go up north someplace and find a clover leaf. What, three leaves? There's such things as four-leaf clovers. I've found them before. You know, But you can pick, pick a clover leaf. There are three leaves, but it's in one plant proves the trinity of God, right? Uh, th there's many things that are trinitarian in thinking. An egg has a shell, a white, and a yolk. Three things, but it comprises one egg. You all understand that? The tree has the bark, the, the pulp, and the sap comprising a tree. The trinity. So you see God in all of these things of nature, you know. I can go out bass fishing and I see God, you know, chasing the bass and, and, and the sunrise and, and all the things that I'm able to see when I'm out fishing. You see God. So in nature itself, God does exist. And so Paul says, because of that, there's no excuse for not. You may not know. You may have never have attended a church. You may have never had a Bible. You've maybe never gone to a Bible study or anything such as that. But 
if you look at nature itself, you will see that God exists. You see? So no one is without excuse. Verse 21. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks, and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshipped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other, men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Ouch! Ouch! But that's pretty strong. And since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never have been done. Okay? Let's look at another portion of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want you to understand something. This does not say will not go to heaven, but they will not inherit the kingdom of God. What we're talking about here is the kingdom blessing. That's what Joe was talking about last Wednesday night. The kingdom blessings. The kingdom blessings. Well, what Paul is saying here to the church in Corinth, the things, the people that, that don't do the right things, they will not inherit the kingdom blessings. It doesn't say they will or will not go to heaven. It has nothing to do with heaven. It's talking about the kingdom now, the kingdom of God living within each and every one of us now. Christ in us is the hope of glory, you see. And because Christ lives within us, there are blessings that we can expect to walk out in this life. All right? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. They will not receive their blessings in this life. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, past tense. How were they cleansed? Jesus cleansed them by the finished work of the cross. Jesus cleansed them. You were made holy. How were they made holy? By the things they did or not do? No, they were made holy by what Jesus Christ did. See? Christ is the one who makes us righteous. Christ is the one who makes us holy. It's because of Christ. It's not the things that we do or we don't do. You all understand this? And then, then he goes on to say, you were made right with God by calling. You, listen, you were made righteous. That's what it, what's it talking about. You were made righteous. How were you made righteous? By See, the church has taught, the institutional church has taught you, you were made righteous by what you do. You don't do this, and you do this other thing. You don't do that thing, and, and by the things you do, you are made holy, you are made righteous. Poppycock. That's a lie. That's not the truth of what the new covenant of grace is all about. Here's what the truth is. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. It doesn't say you cleanse yourself. Paul didn't say that. He said you were cleansed. You were. You were made holy. You were made right with God. How? By calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We talk about what? The easy and light life that Jesus promised. 
And the church has got us all working so hard to be and to do and to cleanse ourselves up. And, you know, if, the, if we don't do it right, then judgment's going to fall on us. And we're all going to be, you know, remember this little rule that any time you try to follow God by any kind of law, there's only three things that will ever follow. That's fear, shame, and condemnation. And here's the reason why. Because there's not a one of you that can ever, there's not a one of us here, including myself, that can keep any kind of a law we're all lawbreakers to that degree. Hopefully we don't get it. Hopefully we, we start walking places where we get a little bit better at it, and we do. But the fact of the matter is, we all have broken laws of God. We all will break laws of God. God knew that. That's why he sent Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior we have. I tell you what, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a blazing, you want to know what I am? I'm a blazing Jesus freak. I really am. I've been, I'm more of a Jesus freak than I've ever been in my entire life because I'm seeing what he's done for me. My lands. All right. You see this? So we see these other things, you know, th these are not good things. And Paul said, look, don't judge these people because you all were like that. See? That's what he says in Romans 2. In Romans 1 there, he says, you all were like that. You all did these things. So don't get on your high horse thinking that you're better than everybody else. I believe what Paul would say this to the church today. Read some of the junk that's out there today in social media about the Supreme Court decisions. Who, what right do you have to be? You know, you bunch of, you know, here's these, 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 these preachers that, that they're all involved in condemning all these, these homosexual people. And as they're writing on Facebook on one hand, one minute, they're in their computer looking at pornography the next. Who, who died and made us judge? You know, that was taken care of. You know, what, some of the things that, oh, you ought to not do this, and you ought to not do that. One guy really got personally says, yeah, and some of you that are overweight. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to show you there's a difference in some of this stuff in a minute, too. But, but, but you all understand, let's forget this judgment. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it several times in this meeting, or in this message here. Uh, I'm going to try to wind it down here as quickly as I can. But I'm going to say it several more times. I want you all to know any gay person has the full right to walk in that door and worship with me any time they want to worship with me. And guess what? When they come here, they're not going to be judged nor condemned. But let me finish what I'm about to say. All right? Turn with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I got you all wondering, what in the world is he trying to get to here? I can read it by the looks in your eyes. One of the things, if you've been preaching as long as I've been preaching, <laughs> you know how to look at people's faces and see what's, what's cooking. And the question marks on some of your faces right now, like, Ooh, where's he going with this? 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. We know that the law, here's he's talking about the law to Timothy. This is Paul again. He's talking to Timothy about the law. He says, we know that the law is good when used correctly. For the law was not intended for people to do what is right. It was for people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who will kill their father and mother or commit other murders. Verse 10, the law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news, the gospel entrusted to me by our blessed God. Now you see, he lumps a whole bunch of other things in along with homosexuality, doesn't he? You see that? And he says... For those people that are involved in those things, what they have done is because they're not walking actively and living actively in the kingdom of God, they have now literally placed themselves under the law. By their actions, they would play. And I'd say this to anybody who is a homosexual if they came here and if they really wanted to talk about it, say, you know what? What you're doing by your actions, you're placing yourself under the, under the old covenant law because this is not pleasing in the sight of God. Now, I wanted to read those to you because I find that and again, this is only Paul's rendering on the subject. We could go, we could spend another hour reading a bunch of other scriptures dealing with the subject from the Old Testament right on through Jesus, right on, so right on through. But I wanted to just, just stick for 
to Paul for the sake of time as well as, again, um, Paul's understanding of new covenant grace. So it's, a, it's the right, what, what I want you to understand, the same Paul who instituted the whole concept of new covenant grace to the church, who brought the revelation of grace to the church, is the same Paul who wrote these words that I just read to you. So when, when he says those things, I guess I, I think I, I really need to listen up. Listen to me. We have people attending our church right now, right now. I can't name names, and we don't have to, we're not, we're not on a witch hunt here or anything like that. I'm just telling you, we have people attending our church right now who aren't living where they need to be living. Sometimes I wonder if I'm living where I need to be living. I'll be honest. You know, we, we have people. So this is not a witch hunt. This is not. I, I cannot say, well, based upon this, bless God. Listen, there, 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 to me, there was only one perfect man that lived. He died 2,000 years ago. Now he lives in our hearts, see? And, and he's forever making perfect, what? Those who he has, he has perfected, forever perfected those who are being made holy. So we, you and I, are in that process. And the more we come into the understanding of the new covenant grace, what happens? We begin to walk it out. We begin to live it more and more and more. But saying that, I mean it. We will never, we will never, we will never, we will never condemn. We will never persecute. We will never preach at. We'll never, you know, come at anybody who is gay or who is going through a divorce. How come we don't talk about that issue in the church? We accept that one, you know? Or we have people, I, I, you know what I believe in our church? We don't have any of this, thank God. We don't have, there's one thing I hate more than anything else, and I'll tell you what, I'll come on it uglier than an ape when I ever see it rise up. I hate racism with a passion. I used to be an associate pastor of an African-American church in Michigan. Those were some of the greatest days of my life. And I'll be honest with you, one of the things I hate right now, I see how, I, I, I see how some of our Ameri African-American people are being treated in the churches where they have all this hierarchy and all these high mucky-muck bishops running their lives. And I hate that too. That's just a bunch of religion. I want to see, you know what? I want to see what Martin Luther King wanted to see. He wanted to see his people free. I want to see my people, his people, God's people, all people, white, yellow, black, red, green, polka dot. I want to see them all free in Jesus Christ. <laughs> women, you women are some of the most persecuted people in the church. In many denominations, in many churches, you know, you women are, are counted as second-class citizens. Let me tell you something. Divorce people, yeah, we make mistakes. Divorce people are considered second-class citizens in many of the churches in America. I want you to know something. I'm going to say it on record. I'm saying it to you because some of you probably are, are really fitting into this. I want you to know, if you're watching me on YouTube, I want you to know, if you're a divorced person, God loves you. I've never been divorced. He loves you just as much as he loves me. See, we have all these little hobby horses. So we will not persecute anybody who's gay in this congregation. They are welcome to come here. If Jackie and Clyde came to me, and I, they're, they're not, they have a good, strong marriage, and so I, can, I know I can pick on them. But if Jackie and Clyde came to me, and Jackie came to me and said, Clyde, he's... He's messing around. Clyde just turned 80 years old, by the way. So Clyde is messing around with this 21-year-old woman. <laughs> and Jackie would say, more power to him. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and <laughs> we believe in miracles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So they come to me, they come to me, and they say, Larry, man, we're, we're getting a divorce. Fine, okay? Doesn't, doesn't, you know, yeah, it affects us, it affects our church, we're brothers and sisters, but, but as far as having a long stand, you know, we, we got, 
God's problems with it, and you know, but but still, you see, it's it's not it's not going to affect us. So we we have then we have um, Joe and Marcia, we'll just say, who aren't married, and they're just living in fornication. You know, did you see Edie right then? Let me tell you something. She's 90 years old and there's a spark in her, I'm going to tell you. I saw it in her eye. So they're living in fornication. And they come to me and they say, Pastor Larry, we want to get married. Right? Guess what? The moment we say, I do, fornication's ended. Then we have Emmett and Earl. <laughs> and Emmett and Earl are together. I <laughs> know. It's it, it is a pretty revolting thought. <laughs> that is, that is, Earl's, Earl's back there saying, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> they come to me and say, we want to get married. Guess what? It don't end. You see, there's no end to it. You see the big problem with it? Y'all, am, am I reading this stuff right? Come on now. Am I reading it right? I mean, we're having a little fun here, but I mean, this, this, uh, thank God we can laugh. You know, but the, these are the issues that we're dealing with. There is a difference. There is a difference. So, you know, again, years ago, years ago, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, you know, don't preach against sin. This was before I was getting into the revelations of New Covenant Grace. He said, you know, years ago, 15, 20 years ago, he says, don't, I won't, don't want you preaching against sin. I, I said, well, what, what do you want me to do? He says, your job is to lift up Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus said, when I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. My job is a preacher, you, our job as a church is to lift up Jesus Christ, folks. And I just, I have to be foolish enough to believe that if we just spend our time lifting up Jesus Christ, it's all going to be okay. I believe we're going to change the world. I, see, I don't believe it's a bad thing that's happening. I expect this thing to happen. You know what it is? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's a time for the church to shine. It's a time for the church to come out and do great and glorious things. It's time for the kingdom of God to be expanded. And if this is what it takes to kick us in the rear a little bit, to get us going in the right direction, then so be it. But I'm telling you something. This, we are headed into the time of the church's finest hour, folks. And, and I, I really believe that. So we're not to preach against sin. We're to lift up Jesus Christ. We're not to get involved in politics, as we know that, uh, you know, it, it, it's, all, it's all important what God is wanting us to do. And we live in this kingdom now. But I believe that these are important issues.